Hi folks, this is Chris. I'm here to talk with you about alpha diversity. During this section of the tutorial, we will be introducing some tools for visualizing alpha diversity. If you remember, we've already calculated a number of alpha diversity vectors during the core metrics phylogenetic part of the tutorial. Um, we're gonna run a couple of new commands, chime diversity alpha group significance, and chime longitudinal ANOVA. Those will give us the ability to uh, visualize two different types of data, essentially. Um, and we'll talk about some other tools that you may find useful in exploring alpha diversity on your own. Um, we're also going to talk through the resulting visualizations and give you guys a start on how to read them and interpret them. So uh, big picture, why are we doing this? We're doing this because we are testing a hypothesis, specifically the hypothesis that the, the genetics of our humanized Parkinson's mice impact the microbial communities that they support, right? Um, and we will use the visualizations that we produce to explore our data and see whether it it uh, aligns with that hypothesis uh, quantity, qualitatively, um, and maybe whether there are other cofactors that also might influence the microbial community here. And then we'll use the statistics generated to start quantitatively answering questions about how uh, alpha diversity specifically relates to our hypothesis. You're going to need some sample data alpha diversity type objects that we produced in core metrics phylogenetic. You're going to need metadata from our study, uh, the same metadata TSV that you've been using. And um, that's really about it for this section, I think. These are relatively simple commands to run and more complex to analyze the results. So as a final refresher before we dive in, um, I'm going to touch again on what is alpha diversity and what alpha diversity is not. I know you've heard this a thousand times, um, but it's an important distinction to grasp. Alpha diversity measures the diversity within samples and gives us some quantitative metrics we can use to compare those samples, but but is not comparing the things within the samples to one another. Um, so that is to say that our alpha diversity measure, uh, let's take one for example, Faith's phylogenetic diversity. Um, for two different samples, Faith's phylogenetic diversity might be identical, but that doesn't mean anything about the similarity or difference between the type of species or taxa that exist within those samples. So you could have identical alpha diversity and completely different community profiles in terms of what critters are in each sample. It just means they have the same amount of diversity, right? I think we probably beat that one over the head by now. I hope, I hope it's all clear. Um, and I think it's time to do some fun stuff. Let's play, let's play with the command line. So here I am in Chrome. At our apps page, opening Secure Shell, you guys have done this a thousand times by now. Uh, so the real value here is that maybe you'll get a laugh if I can't figure out how to type my password. Let's see, did I win the prize? I win the prize! So I'm now in our Secure Shell. I can ls to see where I am and what, what is available in my current directory. Um, I'm gonna want to head into that workshop directory. Now that we are in the workshop directory, I will type ls again to see what uh, Chime 2 artifacts we have to work with. You'll notice that we have the metadata TSV, that is the sample metadata we would have collected during our study, and this core metrics results directory, which holds all of the results of core metrics phylogenetic which we ran together during the core metrics section of the tutorial. Now, you guys have probably done some sections of this tutorial that I have not, 
Um, and so you may have other things in this directory that I don't have. If you see other files, that's totally okay. Just make sure that you've got your metadata and you've got your core metrics results. Now, for the sake of seeing different ways of working with Chime 2, um, I'm going to, in just a moment, show you how I would go about entering commands into the command line to produce some output. Um, before we do that, though, let's, as a group, click over to the Parkinson's Mouse Tutorial, copy our first alpha group significance command. Again, I'm just clicking the copy button, as you've done a couple times now. Clicking back to secure shell and pasting that command in. Looks a little funny because my font is so big, um, but this is the same command that you're pasting in. And you guys can hit enter and let this run. Um, and I'm going to, for my part, just delete it and take you through my normal process when I'm, when I'm entering a command into Chime 2. Let's say I know that I want to investigate the alpha group significance of my samples, right? I've already produced my core metric stuff, but I don't remember how to go about using that tool. Rather than going and looking up the documentation, if I'm already in a Chime 2 environment, I can start typing in Chime diversity. I know it's in Chime diversity, right? But what exactly is it called? I'll just ask for help. I flip up through here. Oh, it's alpha group significance. So I come back here and I go alpha group significance. I still don't remember everything I need to pass to that, like all the arguments that I need to pass to the method. So I'm going to, again, just scroll up through the help and see what things it wants. It wants uh, an artifact of type sample data alpha diversity. It wants that metadata file. We know what that is. And it wants an output file path, and that's it. So this is going to be pretty simple. We will chime diversity alpha group significance. Notice the backslash that I put at the end of that line. The command line expects to get any command in a single line, but you've seen how long these Chime 2 commands can be. So to make them more readable, we use backslashes to allow us to break one command up over multiple lines. When you're using them, make sure that the backslash is the last thing on the line don't, for example, put a space afterwards. That wouldn't work. Um, and then immediately after putting in the backslash, you can hit enter and begin working on the next part of the command. The command line itself will then interpret all of those lines of text that are separated by backslash as a single command, rather than as five or six different commands with one command per line. You'll notice that I tab complete everything. If I hit tab partway through through typing something in, uh, the command line will usually, because uh, some smart people set it up to do this, will usually tell me what the rest of the, the thing I'm typing is. So I can I alpha diversity, and I know that I want something from core metrics results, and I think I want the faith PD vector. I typed FAI and tab, and it filled in the rest for me. I know I want some metadata, and that's probably called metadata TSV. And I want to output a visualization. And I don't remember what we called that in the tutorial, but I'll use the same thing just to ensure that we've got continuity. Faithspdstatistics.qzv, and we put it in core metrics results. Or metrics results, faiths, pd statistics dot qzv. I'll hit enter and we'll find out whether I got all the typing right. It looks like that worked just great. Having done that exercise once, we'll just copy paste the next one.
I don't know exactly what happened there when I pasted that in. So we're gonna we're gonna Control C to cancel that command and try one more time. Yeah, I don't know what's happening on this paste. That's really unusual. That looks better. All right, success. We have produced two beautiful, I'm sure, visualizations. Um, now, I'm going to show you guys this screen because this is what I did earlier when trying to get ready for the, uh, the tutorial. And this is the kind of mistake that you might make. Um, when you see 403 forbidden, it probably just means that you don't have permission to access something. For me, that's because I forgot to put in my username when I wanted to navigate to the server of our results. Once I put in migratory mole, everything looks good. And I can look in core metrics results and find our QZVs. We've got a faith PD statistics.qzv. Copy that link. Go to view.chime2.org. Open a file from the web. And we're in business. Look at that beauty. I'm going to open up the second one at the same time so that we can kind of group everything together. First, we'll copy the link, open a new tab, navigate to view.chime2.org. Once the page loads, we will go down to the File from the Web link, click on that, click in the box, paste in our URL, and click Go. Um, and this is, a, this is a pattern that you'll see a lot in these tutorials probably, but especially in your, in your work on an analysis where you, you open up multiple visualizations of the same type using different metrics so that you can kind of compare and contrast what those different metrics tell you about your data and maybe extrapolate some more information for, about, your, about your community of study based on the different meanings of those different metrics, right? All right, let's dig into these alpha group significance plots that we put together. Um, just to make sure we've got everything straight, we've got this even the statistics plot on the right and the face PD statistics plot on the left. You'll notice that these both include these little warnings at the top telling us that certain metadata columns have been omitted because they did not contain categorical data. The reason that's the case is because uh, only categorical data can be viewed well with this, uh, this approach. Um, there is another tool, and you'll see this mentioned in the Parkinson's Mouse tutorial, uh, called Alpha Correlation, right here, which we can use to similarly visualize continuous covariates. Uh, so if our study was looking at the impact of temperature or altitude or some other numerical, continuous numerical value, um, we would probably want to use Chime Diversity Alpha Correlation to see how that factor influenced the diversity of our communities. Here though, all we've really got is time. We'll deal with time later during the longitudinal section. Um, and we're going to stick with alpha group significance for now. Um, so first glance at this plot, we've got our diversity metric on the left. And we've got whatever metadata column we want to know about on the x-axis. Um, so in this case, we're looking at the mice and the, the differing diversities of our different mice. That's probably interesting for someone else's study, but here we're more interested in genotype, right? That makes the plot much simpler. Um, and you'll notice that like first things first, you look at this plot, and if you've looked at box plots before, 
you probably think, oh, those look pretty similar. Um, a box plot is essentially, and this this block, box plot is spe spe specifically, um, describes the distribution of our data points across this y-axis of diversity metric. So here, our median is the center line, and our interquartile range, the 25th, 75th percentiles, is described by 75 and 25. These lines and the dots that you see occasionally are outliers. So these are data points that fall far outside of the, the main body of the distribution. These n values at the bottom describe the number of samples included in or described by this box. So there are 24 susceptible mouse samples, 23 wild type mouse samples. Um, and so these medians are quite similar. The, the, the bottom bound here is a little bit distant from the other, but you know, generally I would look at this and say, oh, these don't look very different. These are probably pretty similar. We can quantify that though by scrolling down and looking at the results of our Kruskal-Wallis test. Um, Kruskal-Wallis is used to tell us whether there's a statistically significant difference between groups in this grouping. So specifically here between susceptible and wild type mice. Um, and here we've got an H statistic and a p-value, and that p-value is quite high. Um, so that tells us in no uncertain terms that there is no sig statistically significant difference between these two factors based on evenness and genotype. All right, as I click over to the FAITH's phylogenetic diversity statistics, I notice something different happening, right? Um, we are, once again, we're plotting the same data against a different diversity metric here. Um, and when we look at these box plots, they seem a little more interesting to me. We have medians that are a little farther apart, uh, a much broader box with much farther outliers in the wild type mice. Um, and generally, the shape of the data looks different. So rolling down to, you know, my first, I guess my first gut here when I look at this plot is like, there's not a huge difference, but maybe there's something that we can work with. Rolling down to Kruskal-Wallis, we find that we do actually have a 0.02 p-value, meaning that in many disciplines, at least, this is a significant result. Um, Seeing this in, in many disciplines would tell us that genotype does actually have a significant role to play in uh, changes in diversity, in phylogenetic diversity specifically. The fact that Faith's phylogenetic diversity is significantly higher in our wild type mice um, suggests that the richness of that microbial community in the mouse guts is higher in the wild type than in the susceptible mouse. Um, if we wanted to learn more about that, though, it might be worth comparing this visualization with other visualizations of species richness. We could look at observed features um, or any of the other richness measures out there. And that might tell us about kind of the ways in which those species compositions differ, which could be really useful. The fact that we don't see the same result in evenness is a product of our of the dis difference of those two diversity metrics, right? While richness measures like Faith's phylogenetic diversity focus on the number of taxa in a community, where more taxa indicate more diversity, um, and sometimes, as in the case case of Faith's PD, also weight by some sense of dis difference between taxa. Um, Evenness is a, is a completely different beast, measuring essentially how evenly distributed the number of features per taxa in a sample are. Um, so we really are looking at completely different ways of thinking about diversity here.
with median values around 0.75 for both our susceptible and wild type mice, we have relatively high evenness in these, in these samples, which indicates that most of the different types of features we have in the communities are found in roughly the same sized groups. Um, so that's another interesting result. One other question that you guys might be asking yourselves right now, it's a question that had me scratching my head for a while, is many of you are probably looking at p-values that are not significant, or at least are much closer to the boundary of significance. Um, taking, for example, the, uh, the visualization in the Parkinson's mouse tutorial, when this was run, um, we can see that our p-value here, run on the same data, has a non-significant 0.06 p-value, right? Um, and so the quest, sorry, I'm looking at mouse ID here. I should be looking at genotype. Um, it's actually a 0.11 p-value, so even worse. And so the question I asked myself when I first noticed this was like, why is this happening? Like, we're using the same sequences. We're doing the same things with them. Why am I getting different p-values? Um, and I want to bring us back very briefly before we let this go to core metrics phylogenetic. If you remember, we input a sampling depth. We use that sampling depth to randomly subsample our data to a depth of 2,000 sequences per sample. Now, during that part of the tutorial, we talked about how that's a compromise. Um, but it's that, it's that random subsampling that means that at this point, my data probably looks a little different from your data, which looks a little different from your partner's data, and looks a little different from the data in the tutorial itself. Um, this is a natural, natural kind of side effect of random subsampling. And it's important to recognize that um, if we were able to sample at a greater depth, maybe at 10,000, which would be not uncommon for a, a fecal data set like this, we would probably expect um, more stability in p-values across trials because our subsampled set would better represent our data at large. Um, so using a very small data set is problematic here. Um, and subsampling to a small number of sequences can be a challenge because you may end up with slightly different values and that could impact essentially how you report your, your results. I hope that little tangent was useful for you. I think at the end of the day, the, the core idea is keep as much of your data as you can, right? So if you can subsample at a greater depth without discarding samples that are important to your study, that's probably a good idea um, and might improve the reliability of your results. So I think we're ready to move on from these alpha group significant plots um, with one exception. Imagine we were doing something where we were comparing more than two groups, right? We're looking at genotype and donor status, or we're looking at um, cage ID, for example, if we're interested in understanding cage effects in terms of alpha diversity. We might plot the cage IDs on here. Um, and these, these statistics are interesting, right? We don't have a significant p-value here, but, um, but it's worth going a little farther down to see the pairwise Kruskal-Wallis comparisons, because some of our cages might relate in significant ways to others. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, because this is already a pretty long section. But when we look at this, I'll give you a quick, a quick walkthrough. These are comparisons from cage 31 to cage 35 to cage 42 to cage 43, etc. Um, an H statistic and a P value follow. And then most importantly, a Q value. Because when we do these pairwise comparisons, we are making multiple tests of the differences. We have to account for multiple testing bias here. Um, and this Q value is the, is the statistics to use if you want to incorporate 
that multiple testing correction. We are using the Benjamini Hochberg um, correction. Um, and so this is a Benjamini Hochberg corrected value. And you'll notice that these Q values are generally higher than the P values to their left. If you're reporting the difference between two cages, then you should probably be reporting both your p-value and your q-value and using your q to indicate significance or not significance. One final point before we leave alpha group significance behind. Chime 2 doesn't know anything about donors or Parkinson's or cage effect or any of that on its own. And so it's really important if you want to get valuable results from your data that you keep really good metadata because all of the things that we've investigated here in this visualization all of those categories we're using to describe difference between groups in our data are things that we have fed to chime to in our metadata tsv so we're at a point in the tutorial where we can start answering some real questions about our samples, which is really neat. Um, question one is, is there a difference in evenness between genotype? Is there a difference in phylogenetic diversity between genotype? Um, and so I think we've already seen how we would go about this, right? First, we are selecting the column we, are, we want to interrogate, in this case, genotype, and then we are Kind of taking a quick glance and rolling down to our test statistics. Um, in this case, there is no difference that is statistically significant in evenness. But there is a statistically significant difference in faith's phylogenetic diversity. Um, and so that is a result that we could report. Um, this is a potentially useful thing to know. Um, because it shows us that genotype is having, does have a relationship with changes in diversity. And remember, just because two different measures of diversity produce different results for you, doesn't mean that there's necessarily a problem, especially if those results are from measures as different as evenness and faith's phylogenetic diversity. Taking a really simplistic example, like the ones we saw in the lecture material, Imagine you have sampled a community and found three species of the same genus of bacteria, and you find three individuals from each of those species in your sample. So nine individuals total, three individuals from each of three species, would leave you with perfect evenness. You couldn't have a more even community. On the other hand, if those three species are all very closely related, you might have pretty low faith's phylogenetic diversity. That doesn't mean that you have a non-diverse community in terms of evenness. And your high evenness doesn't mean that you do have a diverse community in terms of faith PD. Just that those two measures are very different and need to be interpreted independently. And sometimes it's worth looking at how those two different ideas interact. Our second question is maybe even more interesting. Um, it asks first, again, is there a difference in phylogenetic diversity by genotype? And then is there a difference based on donor? Um, and this is, where, this is where exploring things with visualizations can be really useful. You can test your hypothesis, as we have done, and in the process also start gathering information about other categories, other factors that might be um, that might be important, right? And so, when I change from genotype to donor to ask whether donor has a significant effect on evenness, for example, I see the most dramatic difference that we've seen in any of these visualizations so far, um, and uh, an extremely small p-value. Um, so what that tells me, especially looking at, at it alongside another significant phase phylogenetic diversity uh, value, is that donor might actually play a more powerful role in determining alpha diversity 
then genotyped it. Um, that doesn't mean that our hypothesis is not being supported. It just means that there are other factors, like in any experiment, there are other factors that we should probably consider as we move forward with our analysis. Um, so when we get into beta diversity, for example, you'll see that we spend some time looking at differences based on donor because donor plays such a significant role in changes in the microbial community in this study. I think at this point we can move on to our uh, second command and the last thing that we'll really cover in this section of the tutorial, which is CHIME Longitudinal ANOVA. We'll break this command apart real quick because it does some interesting things. Um, First things first, you'll notice that there are no input values, but that we are passing a QZA, a CHIME2 artifact, into ANOVA as metadata. Um, and this I'm not going to spend a lot of time with. It's a little more advanced. But basically, CHIME2 is able to read a number of different types of data as metadata, which allows you to do some really powerful things. Uh, here then we are passing in our vector of alpha diversity, sample, sample data alpha diversity, as metadata. We're passing in our metadata as metadata. ANOVA will handle that gracefully. Um, and then we're giving ANOVA a formula describing how we want it to do its work, essentially what differences to look for. Here we're looking at phase phylogenetic diversity and the uh, the intersection between genotype and donor status. There's a lot of great information on how those formulas work in the documentation for the ANOVA command, which you can pull up from your terminal or at docs.chime2.org. Um, if I just search for ANOVA, I am right where I need to be. And you can see that there's a good write-up here as well as some outside resources that you can use to learn better how these R-style formulas are structured and what they mean. We also have, as usual, an output file path. I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna paste it into our terminal. And I'm going to hit enter until it goes. <laughs> All right, we did it. We've got another visualization. Um, we can navigate back to our migratory mole results. This was produced, I think, in core metrics results. So we're in the right place. You notice I refreshed the page so that the, this display knows about the Faith's PD ANOVA QZV we just produced. And I will, just as before, copy the URL of the visualization I want to look at, open a new tab, click the File from the Web link, paste the URL into the box that pops up, and press go. So looking at this uh, ANOVA visualization, um, I guess I want to start by saying that ANOVA is a, a more complicated model to explain and to understand. Um, I'm not a statistician, and I don't have a particularly good grasp on it myself. But hopefully I can give you guys a good high level. Um, and many of you have probably seen ANOVA in other places. Um, this is the same ANOVA. Specifically here, we have, uh, we have implemented a type 2 ANOVA, if that means anything to you. Um, and we will use ANOVA here, just like anywhere, um, as like a multivariate approach to determine whether multiple factors are correlated with diversity in a significant way. Um, here we are looking specifically at Faith's phylogenetic diversity. 
Um, and we'll start just by looking at the model results table at the top of the screen. You'll notice along the left-hand side that each of the factors in our original formula, if you remember our formula was faith PT by genotype and donor status, um, each, of the, each of those genotype and donor status factors are given their own line where they are given a number of summary statistics, including their F statistic, and the probability that we would see a more extreme F. All right, this is essentially a p-value, but it's a specific p-value. Um, below those two factors is what we call an interaction term. Um, we're not gonna spend a lot of time with this, except to tell you how to interpret it in the context of a uh, type two ANOVA. Um, but if you don't already have a grasp on this, it's a great conversation with your local statistician. Um, so when I first start looking at this at this table, what I'm looking for is essentially a high F statistic and a low p value. Um, and here, you know, we've got we've got a significant p value for donor status, and we don't have a statistically significant p value for genotype. It is quite close to the R threshold for significance though. Um, so it's probably worth reporting anyway, and it's definitely worth investigating further. So we think we might have something significant here, um, but it's really important to note that none of these statistics have any meaning outside of the model we've created here. Um, and that model may or may not have any meaning to our data. Um, and so once we've gotten a sense of what, we're, what, what our high-level statistics look like, we come down to these plots. Um, and you can see that this is a, it's a pair of plots. The data points are identical across the plots. And the coloring is different. Uh, because we're looking at this in terms of interactions, we have essentially two normal values and then two, two columns representing the interaction terms that you see up here. Um, this line gives you a pretty good sense of what you are looking for in these plots. Um, it's really important to note that ANOVA is a, uh, it's a parametric model, and as such it requires, or it assumes that our data is normally distributed. Um, and so when you look at these plots, if you see significant patterns in uh, kind of trends in how these things plot, if you see that your data is not centered at zero, if you see that you have many high or low values, those all might be indicators that your data is non-normal um, and could indicate that essentially the model doesn't fit your data or the model is not appropriate for your data. Um, so even if you think that you've got something significant, if these plots tell you that your data is not normal or inappropriate, this is, this is not a tool that you can use. It's one of the reasons why so many of the tools that we use in Chime 2 and in, in microbiome bioinformatics in general are non-parametric. They allow us to work with non-normal data as needed. Um, here, this actually looks okay. It's not perfect. We have this one outlier that's like pretty far outside of what we'd expect. Um, but we're concerned mostly with systematically high or low values, things that in indicate that um, this is not an outlier, but this is part of a pattern that indicates non-normal distribution. Um, so here we're probably okay, and we might be able to use these ANOVA results to, uh, to make a claim that even after accounting for genotype, donor status is a really significant factor in alpha diversity, specifically faith's phylogenetic diversity. In the interest of time, I'm going to pass over these pairwise t-tests um, in favor of just sticking with a kind of high-level view of ANOVA. If you have questions about how these are implemented or you're particularly interested in them, feel free to ask a question or follow up on the Chime 2 forum. So it's about time to wrap up this section of the tutorial. Um, in summary, what have we learned? 
first, I guess we, we got to play with some exciting new tools. We got to use Alpha Group Significance from the Diversity plugin. We got to use ANOVA from Q2 Longitudinal. Um, and we even gestured a little bit at um, Chime Diversity Alpha Correlation, which you would use for visualizing continuous data. Um, we got our first like quantitative measurements of diversity and used them to support our hypothesis, which is really exciting. Um, we found that genotype does, at least for some diversity metrics, have a, a relationship with alpha diversity. So that's really neat. That means we're probably on the, we're barking up the right tree, right? We're on the right track here. Um, and we also found like a whole new covariate to explore during the rest of our downstream analysis when we found that donor plays a very significant role in alpha diversity. Um, so as we get into beta diversity and other things later on, we'll have a chance to see you know, exactly what kind of role that plays and, and experiment a little bit more, see what we can learn about that. Um, I think that's all for now. I hope this hasn't been too long and I hope everybody learned something today. I certainly have, and I look forward to speaking with you soon.